a second. We are DW News or Deutsche Welle News, a German international broadcaster, but we're here to speak about a very local issue that's been affecting Ghana together with Joy News. Yes, thank you, Edith. Now, if you are in Ghana or you've been following Ghanaian news for the year or this year, then you know that many Ghanaians have come together to fight against the cause. I'm talking about illegal mining, popularly known as Galamsey right here in Ghana. Now, illegal mining is destroying our water bodies and our forest reserves, and a lot of people in Ghana are fed up and tired. Now, this conversation we are going to be having here today, we're going to be hearing from the youth and panelists as well. And I am excited because we get to hear the perspective of the youth on this issue. Absolutely. On this show that's called The 77%. Mm -hmm. Right, so if you're watching us from Ghana, then there's a high chance you're already familiar with Galamse, but the 77% is broadcasting to everyone on the continent and beyond. And so we just want to bring them up to speed on what's happening here. And we're going to play a video with images that you might have seen again if you're in Ghana, but if you're on the other side of the continent, perhaps not. So, Lois, you can tell us what we're seeing right now. Just explain the devastation of this Galamse and how it came to be. Right, so uh, you can see that... From the screen, we can see how degraded our lands have become earlier. I told you that this year, a lot of Ghanaians have come together to fight against illegal mining because it's destroying our water bodies. You can see even our land has to suffer because of illegal mining. Uh, it's sad because most of the youth who are, you know, uh, doing or using this medium to get their source of income do not have any jobs to do or any sustainable jobs. So they end up doing this. You can see that the water, the chemicals, because it is heavily infused with mercury arsenide and all of these things and they are in our water bodies you can see that our water bodies have changed color very very badly so you can see on the land that uh there are it's entering into our forest reserves as i told you you can see that people uh have to drink these waters and they don't look good at all so you can see that uh, it doesn't only affect our water bodies it's entering into the soil um people are you know getting tired of it and that's why we are fighting against it this year most Ghanaians, especially the youth uh, are fighting against this so these rivers are uh, river pra and of thing uh, and Angkor Bra as well. You can see or you can find them in uh, the Ashanti and Central Western regions. And you can see we have Shamfangs in here. A lot of the young people are on grounds working, uh, mining, putting mercury. People are drinking them. Now it's even getting close to the sea. So when you get to the seaside, you can see that sometimes they look very, very dirty. Now these young ones or infants swim in this heavily infused water. I remember that I said we have chromium in this water, we have mercury in this water, all due to uh, galamse or, uh, as I said, illegal mining. Fishermen are also in there. They end up going into uh, to fish and they don't even get any fishes because the fishes are dying, they are discoloring, and it's all due to the heavy uh, metals in this water. So, well, uh, Edith will be talking about this when she comes to the street debates and she's ready for you. So, Edith, take it away. Indeed, and welcome to this absolutely special version of the 77% street debate. This week, we are back in Ghana's capital of Accra. And if the analysts are to be believed, then in just six short years, then this country, which is so rich in biodiversity, could be importing water. And this is due to a phenomena called galamse, known here dialectically. We'll be finding out what that is and how it's come to this situation and what exactly Ghanaians can do to preserve their future. And so I'd like to begin uh, with you, Awolo, because as an environmentalist, I think you have a bird's eye view of what exactly is happening. So for our global audience, please tell us what exactly is galamse and what does it have to do with the environment? Well, galamse, we are using it to say illegal mining. But if you look at the genesis of the word, when we had Galamse in the beginning, it wasn't using heavy machinery. It was called come and gather. So maybe the miners have mined and what's left over, they'll come with hand tools 
and come and gather and sell. So that was Galamse. So using the word Galamse to describe what is happening now, which is on a great scale, on an unprecedented scale, destroying our landscape, poisoning our water bodies. And Ghana water does not remove the mercury from the water. So right now when we are drinking water, we could be drinking water with mercury. Yes. So earlier when we started the program, I said that in six short years, the country could be importing water, which sounds like such an incredible phenomena. But what's the situation presently? What's the state of your water bodies? The state is terrible. I mean, you can see from the images what is going on. So many of our waters have already been contaminated. But the good news, the good news is that this can stop yesterday. All we need is the political will to stop this catastrophe, and it can be stopped. We just need the political will to stop it, to stop the devastation of our forest reserves, and to stop the mining on our water bodies. What is going on is wickedness, it's environmental terrorism, and can be stopped yesterday if the political will is there. Okay, let me speak to James here, who's a miner. Um, and... It sounds almost unfair to constantly associate mining with environmental degradation because as we were speaking earlier, you were telling me you practice clean mining. What is that? Um, uh, like the small scale mining. You see, like my mother said, there are so many forms of mining. Small scale mining, it's what we call um, plant mining. You, have the, you create the dam by yourself and then you use the dam and then the water will go, you'd call it return, it will go turn and come inside the dam again for you to use it to do your washing. But there are some other aspects of it that is making it so difficult for all of us to work. We've been affected and me, myself, I'm a victim of that situation. There are people we call Chamfine and now the Galamse is also taking part of the water. They, do, they dig their hole and then they come and wash on top of the water bodies because they don't have the capacity to do their dams. Yeah, so can you explain to me, because obviously I don't have knowledge in mining, uh, and I'm thinking that Ghana has been mining gold for centuries. So why is it a problem now? Um, the problem is currently gold is very, very expensive. Now, if you are talking about one carat and you are selling it about 260 or 70 cities. So you can see any GSS person can enter into your site and then come with probably a machine or something. As soon as it gets... Uh, like one karate, do you think he will go to class tomorrow? Mm. He is not coming. Yeah. You understand? So that is a very, very big disadvantage to even us, the miners. But if the political will is there, like my mother said, we can easily fight this. Okay. So before we get to the solutions and the political win, I want to come to you, Peter, because I really just want to understand what is motivating people to go to the mines, risk their lives, and pollute the environment. Well, it's as a result of economic hardship. When people are desperate and they want food on the table. They, they, they don't care what they will do to get food on the table. And so this is purely as a result of poverty, as a result of economic hardship, where people think that um, getting something to eat today is what is all. But it, it, isn't, isn't that the, the reality, though? That's the reality. But if it was destroyed yesterday, you wouldn't have met it today. And so the mindset... Is what needs to be corrected because you need to understand that whatever you are doing today will have a replaying effect on you tomorrow. Because you see, what we don't understand or people don't understand is that when you destroy the environment and you get the money, you go out there to buy water that is, I mean, affected with this mercury that we're talking about. You drink it and you get sick. What happened? You go to the hospital. You don't get the strength to go back and do it again. So it is very serious and we think it's far away from us, but everybody is at risk with this phenomenon, with this catastrophe that we're talking about. Because the moment you step out there, the restaurant, wherever you get food to buy, wherever you get water to buy, who knows the source? Mm. Who cares? Yeah. Okay, uh, but this is now a trickle-down effect. But Dr. Obin, because you used to be the CEO of the Miners Commission here, there must be policies against this. As I mentioned, Ghana has been mining gold for centuries. Absolutely. Ghana has been mining gold for a very long time. And uh, we, in fact, it was illegal for small scale miners to, mining to be undertaken up until 1989. So, from the colonial times to 1989, it was designated an illegal activity to mine gold by an indigenous of Ghana, yet people were mining. So, small scale mining has been going on for a very long time. But you see, the kind of implement that were being used. Okay, be, be, before we go on, because you've mentioned small scale mining and illegal mining. Are all small scale miners illegal miners? Not, not necessarily. 
It's just a technique that is used in mining. Uh, if you don't have the license, if you don't have the, the, the right to mine as given by government, and you are operating you know, at, a, at, the, at the blind side of the law, then you are illegal mining. However, if you have a license and you're not operating on your land, you're also illegal. Because your license is related to, in fact, it's indexed to a piece of land. So it, unlike a driver's license where you can use that to drive any vehicle, you can't use small-scale mining license to move away from the indexed concession, the concession that has been given you. So when, once you move out, you become an illegal. And, and, and again, they do have or use the same methodology. So that is the, the, the challenge. However, the small-scale miners are generally being monitored. They are generally being monitored for their operations and, and uh, whenever government wants to talk to them, they are able to get them around to talk to. But those who don't have um, those uh, certification or registration, they are unable, no, government is unable to... to, okay. to, to because I've already seen Mr. Hulu here shaking her head. Let me come back to James. Is what he's saying correct? Does government come and talk to you and engage you at that level? Yes, perfectly. Um, uh, like I was saying, well, in our site, we, we are directly under supervision of extra good. Okay, so if anything go contrary to the rules, you'll be stopped and you'll be fine. And probably your license will be taken from you. Mm -hmm. Because extra good is very, very, very hard when it comes to distance. Yeah. And secondly, extra good will not allow you, from our side, will not allow you to put um, uh, mercury in any water. Because the dam is created by you, so you can put mercury. You can't do that. You can only do that when you get to their office. Okay. Uh, let me come back to you, Mr. Wulu, because I keep hearing the word mercury and these are the very scary uh, chemicals. How does a government allow anyone to use these poisonous elements in mining? You see, there are laws, but you can have laws if you don't enforce the laws. The laws are just decoration. So it's not a question of the absence of laws. It's a question of inability to enforce the laws. And my experience where we have been, a lot of small scale miners are operating without any supervision. That is the experience we have. And we know that one of our problems in Ghana is enforcement, enforcement, and enforcement. And why people are asking for a ban or a pause on small-scale mining is only because with the big companies, even the big companies, we find it difficult to monitor. So how much more the thousands of small-scale miners? I can give you examples of Atronsu, for instance, where there was mining going on, which was destroying the Atronsu stream. The EPA um, was made aware of it, and that was somewhat time in September. As at November, my information that they have not been there to monitor, to see whether the people who claim they have a uh, license were, as the doctor said, actually operating where they should operate. I was also told that even when you have a license, before you start, you are supposed to get some document from the EPA. They hadn't done that. They were operating. Nobody was monitoring. So part of our problem, our problems are many. But part of it are even those who supposedly have licenses go outside the parameters of their license and therefore are acting illegally, as has been said already. And if we are not monitoring, if the EPA and other bodies are not monitoring, how do we know who is washing where they should wash, who is mining where they should mine? You're not supposed to go setting parameters of the water bodies, but it's done anywhere. And nobody's monitoring. So our problem is a lack of monitoring. That is why we are crying, 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 that you need to pause the small-scale mining. There's so many of them, and you're not able to monitor. In the meantime, we're all being poisoned. So I want to introduce Kwaku here, who is a journalist. I think if you watch Joy TV, you definitely have seen this face. Uh, so having covered this topic extensively, how did it creep up on Ghana? Because it feels like you woke up one day and suddenly, oh, our water is under threat. Well, it has always been there, Galamse, and illegal mining has always been with the people. But like I was saying, it used to be very small scale, but now it's becoming very large scale. And the effect has been seen on the water bodies. In fact, in the last eight years, if you look at the river fin, for instance, you look at the color, you look at the texture, you look at the, 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 the chemical composition, and you look at it now, this is how people are now waking up to the reality that illegal mining that has been going on for so many years and people thinking that, listen, this is not something that concerns us, especially for those of us in these urban areas, like Accra in particular, we seem to think like it's going up in some rural area, it doesn't concern you. And so in the last few years, 
the Ghana Water Company Limited has been putting out notices consistently saying that they are unable to provide water to this part of town or that part of town because of illegal mining and because of the high turbidity they are unable to actually treat this water. And so for journalists, we've been covering this for a very long time. And if you look at the archives at Joinies, for instance, we've done a series of stories. But people are now waking up to the reality because they now see they open their taps and the water coming in is completely not something they can use for anything meaningful. For. And so they are waking up to this reality, and that is why people are now hitting the streets and demanding action from government. Okay, so we are hearing that it might take decades, if you're lucky, to clean the water. If that doesn't happen, what's going to happen to Ghana? Well, just like you said, CSIR and other groups have done a lot of research. They've Who are CSIR? The Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Mm -hmm. They've done a lot of research. Some of them have been saying that it could take up to 300 years to properly reclaim our lands and get our water bodies to the clean level that they used to be in the last few years. And so Ghanaians are getting to know that this is the time that something must happen. A lot of Ghanaians are not great to be able to import water from other places like other persons in the high class in society can do. And that is why they are waking up now. They are saying that the damage that has been done is enough. And so they need to get action to stop that damage so that in the next 300 years, if you cannot come concerted efforts and try and fix the damage for now, then that would be better. Government hasn't put up in terms of a plan to say that, listen, if you're able to stop Galamsey, this is exactly what we are going to do to clean up the water and ensure that you don't drink mercury-infused water. That hasn't come, but I get the sense that ordinary people, is think, ordinary people are thinking it is better to stop that now and stop the damage, and then we can all come together as a country and find ways to clean the water bodies and our lands. Okay, I want to come back to James because we keep hearing ban this practice, put it on pause, but that essentially means putting your livelihood on pause. How does that make you Feel. It makes me feel bad because, like, when you are like a whole lot of people doing one thing, and then some are, um, about less than half are doing the right thing, more than half are doing it wrongly, and then because some people are doing it wrongly, it affects everyone. It is very, very bad. Secondly, some when you come to my consistency like this, more than fifty percent of the youth are into this mining, either by um, a foreman or a worker. So you, you could see if you burn it right now. A whole lot of people are going to go hungry. Yeah. Uh, but earlier, as you were speaking, you did mention to me that something terrible happened to you because of this political wave. It's a very charged issue here. And you actually lost valuable capital. Mm. Tell me about that. Um, uh, I lost um, two excavators because of some reason. I wouldn't want to mention the place. But then if you like, I'll, I'll take you to the site one day and have a look at it. I lost two excavators, which was not bought by me. It was through a brother who is in the outside and then. We discussed it and said, well, it's good, we should invest. Because since you are, going, you are doing this on a legal basis, right, it's, it's equally good for me to invest. So like doctor was saying, we got everything right. But four years ago, political pressure and things like this happened, and then boom, yeah. we are here. Indeed, it's become a political issue. In fact, uh, I think it's one of the things that is really being campaigned at, at the moment, uh, which campaigns are still ongoing here in Ghana. But I wanted to speak to you, Mercy, because you're being affected, but in a very interesting way. As a triathlete, as an athlete, water is essential to your work. How are you feeling right now? I feel bad because we are forced now to do all our training and events in the pool instead of doing open water. And due to this, just this ended African Games, we couldn't have an open water swim for triathlon. We had to do a pool because all our water testing goes in and it comes back as a bad review. So we can't do open water, which is very bad. Uh, so what have you been doing? You see you're, you're using indoor pools? Yes, we use the indoor pools. Okay. Uh, I want to hear from some of the people at the back. Anybody who is from a rural area that's really affected by this issue, please raise your hand. I want to hear from you. No one is affected? You all live in Accra? It's not? Okay, let's hear from you, please. Yeah, okay, so when you come to... What's, what's your name? Uh, my name is Justice John. Um, when you come to Konongo, like where I'm from, people are being allowed to mine in these water bodies and then at river banks, which are affecting our lands. When farmers go on farming, they find it difficult to get water, to water their crops. Even children who are from the rural, deep, deep rural areas find it difficult in assessing waters in their everyday life. Yeah. Uh, so we actually have a farmer who will be joining us shortly and he'll be telling us about his experience. But you want to add something? Yeah, my name is Samuel. Well, I'm not from a rural area, but I have a friend that they are from that place. His dad is a farmer and recently two of them are out of school. 
one was fortunate to travel outside and he was saying these days is that finally difficult to cater for his younger siblings because the water when they get from the stream and the water the crop by the time they come back then it dries so even when they go to the market to buy seed for farming or whatever propagation as a result of the irrigation Due to the chemicals in the water, it just dries the seeds. So he's running lost and it's also increasing the depth on their family. So things are becoming difficult for them as well. Uh, and you've talked about it being a social issue and that's exactly what this documentary that you're about to see examines. Have a look. We'll be right back. Meet Baby X, preserved in formalin at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology for observation. He or she is not your normal baby. Baby X is deformed. The baby or the fetus that was in the mother's womb was deformed. Deformed in the sense that the baby had multiple limbs, um, including, I'm talking about upper and lower limbs. Uh, the eye was not well formed, fused together. Um, he had no sexes, that is, there was no identifiable sex. And generally, I mean, in medicine we call it dysmorphic, where you could not see anything that makes the baby, um, if he had been even born, would have lived comfortably in, in life. Professor Sampene traces the cause of the deformities to heavy concentrations of lead, mercury, and cyanide found in the placenta. Well, mercury, cyanide, lead, and arsenic, yes, in that, in that order. They were all there. They were all there. Of course, in some appreciable concentration that could be damaging to the, the normal function or the normal development of the DNA, the baby, and so and so forth. Once it is in the placenta, naturally to be in the baby, because the placenta is the only means by which the baby gets his feet. Baby X is perhaps the strongest proof ever of how heavy metal contamination can alter the developmental stages of a fetus, leading to extreme deformation in babies. If you see them in the literatures, the books that you read, the biology books, the pathology books, anatomy books, the histology books and all those things, sometimes you see them, you feel it's, these are things that are just because, that they are just like toys or something that do not exist, people's, I mean, imaginations. But when I saw it, then I realized that yes, it's true. Baby X's preserved body is a grim presentation of an unseen danger lurking in the midst of communities affected by irresponsible mining and the selfish pollution of the Ghanaian environment for gold. Yeah. Professor Sampini has so far seen and tested four of such babies with extreme deformities. He has similarly found disturbing levels of lead and mercury in all of them. I had a similar call to go and get another one done. That was in Central Region, Dukwa Hospital. And the same thing was found. Then comes other cases in the Shanti Region, where another one was also I mean, found to be in a, in a similar manner. And then the Western Region again, where another one was also found. Then I realized that there's, there should supposed to be some correlation here. And that correlation is what? The spillage of what? Any pollutant, any form of pollutant into the system, into the ecosystem, where we need to uh, actually address. Then I decided, look, let me just now get all the placentas labeled Parts of the babies, they, these fetuses, part organs like the kidney, the liver, these vital organs. Let me just take bits and pieces of them, and then do some work, laboratory work on, around it, and see what could be the reason. He concludes that this is a grim reality of a possible widespread catastrophe which needs further public health research on a large scale. The conclusion is that heavy metals are in the system. Only four fetuses that have done, I believe, and I not I believe, I have seen that 
the helmets are there in them were, were found in them and so that is why maybe in addition to other factors other environmental factors or genetic factors or something the stimulant or the stimulant could be just the the, uh, the, the heavy metal Wow, so you've all seen there the consequences of the heavy metals in the water here in Ghana, affecting not just this generation, but potentially the future one. Lois, I wonder what you think about this. You know you're also working today. Yes, what do people are. think out there? <laughs> well, I told you that if there's anything I am excited about, is the fact that youth are not keeping quiet on this issue. They are ready to let us know what they think when it comes to how bad our water bodies have gotten because of illegal mining and how our forest reserves are getting uh, worse and worse by the day. But, well, I have with me my bystanders who were going to find out. Uh, they've listened. They've heard. What do they think? How do they feel about this? Let me go to Joseph. Joseph, now you've been listening very well I was looking at you from the back and I saw that you were paying keen attention now you've heard how bad our water bodies are getting how does that make you feel as young as you are it makes me feel very very scared because as a young person I keep on asking that we have clean water to drink our grandchildren our great-grandchildren our leave them are we being responsible enough are we thinking into the future are we being insightful about the being deformed so you wouldn't even be sure to have a you wouldn't be sure to have a fully developed baby when you are going to give birth. You'll be having doubts because of galamsey. It's very scary. It will affect our youth. It will affect our children, even infants and unborn children, if we don't take care of it now, if we don't do something now. And I think um, agencies or government or whoever is responsible is not seeing how urgent the situation is. Because me, for instance, when I buy water, when I buy a bottle of water, even as at now, I feel scared. Because I have doubts. What if there is mercury inside? So if a mother, a pregnant mother, a woman takes this water, would it affect her unborn child? To what extent has this gotten worse? Is it, is it killing babies in the womb? I have a lot of questions. But I don't see the activism about this. I don't see the campaign enough. So I think as young children, we cannot, or young youth, sorry, the youth, we can put our voice out there to let people know that it's serious because we form the majority of the population. So we can put our voice out there as we are watching the news, as we are being informed, social media, all the campaign, demonstration and all of that. We can also add our voices to it for the government and institutions responsible to know that if they don't take action, if they don't make a move, we'll all be affected. You think that we, the youth are doing enough? Because I know we've done the protest already. Already we saw that people were even arrested during the protest. Do you think we are doing enough? You're not doing enough, but we are trying. We are trying our best. People are protesting online, on Twitter, on all social media platforms. Um, demonstrations here and there but i think it's not enough it's not persistent it's not pressuring those responsible to take action so i think we can do more going forward Yes. Now, I like that you spoke about mothers uh, taking in this water. This brings me to Nadezwa. Now, good afternoon, ma'am. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. All right. Now, we've been paying attention to this conversation. I'm coming to you as a mother. Now, we have mothers who are taking in this water with heavy metals in it from mercury to lead. Uh, as a mother, how does that make you feel? And also, how do you think that you can arise uh, and end or put a stop to this finally? I spoke to a gentleman called Erastus. He had been abducted, he, um, abducted by miners, um, Galamsey miners. And I asked him, I said, Erastus, how can this end? And he said, mommy, it won't end till the gold is finished in the soil. I wept. When he said that, I wept. He said to me, he had been to a village where the gold is finished and they have abandoned the village and the people in the village are still being poisoned their waters are poisoned their land is poisoned can which mother's dream is it 
to give birth to a child or which grandmother's dream is it to see her grandchild with a leg or a foot on its back or three or four eyes which mother or grandmother's dream is that or father's dream his firstborn child we know we are being poisoned fine I haven't talked about the cancers yet those people who are mining with the mercury and other heavy metals every penny they earn will not heal them ever in this world never all the money they are making today ruining the water for all of us they will never enjoy their money but not as well. no i'm not cutting you these people especially people living in when she has said that they do not have any other source of income so can they be blamed no they cannot be blamed who should be blamed who should be held responsible it is political they have to do it who has to create employment me there are people there who know and said they would and didn't and have not delivered till today why are they still there as everybody says we all know look at, look at, look at, look at these young children i will call them they know what's going on and we are talking we are on demonstrations, we are shouting, we are on TV channels, we're doing every thing we can. People like Awula Sewa, document upon document upon document, fighting this thing. And the people who are supposed to be in charge, where are they? And what are they doing? This, look at this young man. I don't even know whether the water he's drinking is clean. I am so afraid. I have a son sitting there. I brought this boy from UK to come and help me. I am now so ashamed that I brought this man from UK to come and drink this. What, is, what, child, what grandchild is this going to give me? I don't want any grandchildren. Young men, ladies, don't do it. It's not worth it. Do not do it. Don't have children. Until they clean your water, let the population go down. Let them feel your pain. Well, you heard from Nadeswa. People have to do their jobs. We have jobs to do. Those who are in charge have to do jobs now let me go now this conversation is an all-inclusive conversation so we have persons living with disability uh visually impaired and i will speak straight to you uh foster now you have paid attention you i know i've spoken to you so many times and you are very passionate about such things now how are you feeling and how do you think or what do you think should be done to solve this instantly especially for us the youth okay i would say um as the labor force uh, previously said they will go on strike just because of this galamse. I think they have to do it because I, for instance, I can't see some of the sachet waters, they are not clean. Even if you buy it, some of your colleagues can tell you that this sachet water that you are drinking is not clean. How much more me I can see? So whenever I buy the water, I just take it like that because I know it has gone through processes. So I feel very bad about this. All right, Esther, let me come to you as well. Uh, what do you think we can do? What advice do you have or what do you think we should do to solve this immediately? Because this is getting out of hand. I think um, there are laws that has to be really enforced. And it shouldn't be a temporal something as the government is doing now that he's sending military men to guide the sites, places and stuff. No, that's not the right thing. A lot of people are writing petitions, but so it is ongoing. Recently, I heard um, at Ebri, somewhere in Ebri, people are still mining, and unfortunately, all of them died there. So are you trying to say the government hasn't heard of this? And at another time, too, I heard that there were policemen who were taking money from these people. So why is it that those that have to stop these things, they are really um, enforcing these? So I think the government has to put measures in place in order to stop this because um, as a visually impaired, you know this water that we are drinking are polluted and um, you take this water, then when you are pregnant is making people become deformed. So as a visually impaired, should I take in these water and maybe give birth my daughter or her son who also be a person living with disability? After all, the government is not even catering for us. So what if I also bring somebody in this world and a person is also a visually impaired? What is the government going to do? So there have to be laws that the government has to implement to stop these things. 
Now, I know that we are all speaking about it, but if the government is not working, if the government is not doing the job, what is we as youth or what are we as youth going to do to stop it? Let me come to you, my darling. All right. Um, for me, <laughs> I believe the government is trying, the youth is uh, also trying to protest against it. And we should all come together. The government should, should, as she said, enforce the laws. I learned something new that if you, you have the licenses, all right, but if you go outside, um, outside the land, you are illegal, um, doing illegal mining. So the law should really be enforced. Really be enforced. You hear from here now. Uh, so, Joy News Research Desk shows that two million uh, youth in this country are not working, unemployed. And I mean, if they were employed, I don't think they'll be doing these jobs. I'm coming to you because I can see that you're shaking your head. What do you have to tell me? All right. So it has to do with the atomistic, like the busy Ghanaian. We should have that in mind. We are Ghanaians and I'm unemployed. I'm suffering. Things are hard. Does that mean I should use any means to get something, to put something on my table? That's what we should think because the government up there, um, those in power up there, if things become difficult, they have the money. They will travel out of the country. They will survive and all. But you, the one down here suffering, or you are suffering unemployment, hunger and all of that. So if you are also engaging in something that would bring down health and all of that. I know one lady who gave birth in Akimoda like two months ago and her child has to be put on oxygen for like more than a week and all of that. But there's no money. And she has not done anything to suffer this. So the Ghanaian, we being Ghanaians, we should look at the fact that we are Ghanaians first. We should think about our unborn children. Because if our fathers did this, would we have had the waters we came to meet only for us to come and then destroy them? So it should be Ghanaians first before we think of what to put on our tables and how to even survive. Because those up there, if we think we are doing something for uh, for people not to vote for them or we are doing something to bring their name down, to tarnish their image whatsoever, we are harming ourselves because if anything happens, they will travel and leave us here. Right, so you heard that we are Ghanaians first. Before anything, we have to remember that we are Ghanaians first. Now, we have an activist amongst us. You have been on the grounds. We've protested. Youth have done everything we can. We're using our social media platforms to preach this message. It's not going through. What else should we, the youth, do? Well, I've listened to you carefully ask my um, colleagues that how do they feel? And the responses are generally, I am sad, and some say, I am afraid, I'm frightened, and things like that. Nobody is saying, I am angry. So we are not angry. Everything must come to a standstill in this country if we really understand what is happening. It is shameful that only 54 people have been arrested for fighting for all of us. And we must bow down our heads in shame. Because this is something that concerns all of us. It has, it has serious implications. I'm also disappointed in neighboring countries that have decided to allow Ghana to destroy their water bodies. Because when these waters are polluted in Ghanaian spaces, they do not remain here in, in, in Ghana. They go all the way to Togo, to Burkina Faso, to... Um, Ivory Coast and all of that. Why haven't any of these countries seen the need to take Ghana on at, let's say, an international platform like um, the ECOWAS or AU or the International Criminal Court? Because this is a crime against humanity. When the president who is vested with authority to stop this nonsense going on, when he was confronted on the matter, he said, Party Nyeska. Party Nyeska. So the party must live for, for, for the people, for the nation to die. Such a senseless answer. And yet, Ghanaians have tolerated this. For me, the disappointment also comes from the fact that it appears common sense is, is, is not on the table. And when I say that, some people are waiting for their party officers to instruct them, hit the streets before they do. 
for something as basic, for something as commonsensical as this. You, I mean, if you cannot even understand the, the difficulties or the dangers of mercury and all of that, can't you see? I mean, what about the water? Can't you see that your water has turned brown? And so on that scale alone, I feel very disappointed. And I feel there is a need for Ghanaians, our campuses, to become spaces of fire and brainstorm to ensure that an end to this nonsense is done. You heard him. We are not angry enough. We are not doing too much. Ghanaian youth have to rise, fight for what we believe is us. Um, edit this on standby. And when we come back, we have more. Indeed, the people you've spoken to have made some incredible points. Now, earlier, I did mention that we would have a farmer joining us. And I think it's super critical that you've joined us at this juncture. We're hearing the activists there talking about the waters living here. They know no borders. They go into other countries. Those same waters are feeding your cocoa farm. How are you managing to be uh, a farmer at the moment? Actually, being a farmer in Ghana now has become a big issue. Because the kind of water we use for spraying is terrible. The area specifically where I'm coming from is Etiwa West. And then when you go to Etiwa West and Etiwa East, the main streams over there is brim. If you see the way it is, there's nothing to write home about. And the lands which we are supposed to use for this cultivation too, is nothing to write home about. Okay. At first, Ghana used to be Ghana, when you mention Ghana, you say Ghana is cocoa, and cocoa too was Ghana. But as, as I'm speaking to you now, Ghana is Galamse. Ghana is no more cocoa, but it is Galamse. Because all the lands has been destroyed. All the lands has been destroyed. Okay, but are you speaking of personal experience? Are the neighboring farms being converted to mines? Are you finding that your production has come down? Exactly. It has come down. If you go to my community, to be precise, I am from Etiwa West. And the community where I have my farm is Ekukuso. If you go there right now, the whole area has been converted into mining activities. And who are we? Because when we talk, people don't bother. When we talk, nobody responds to us. And the rivers over there too, those who are in the villages cultivating these crops too, getting water has become... Yeah. So it has therefore increased the cost of living. So as I'm speaking to you now, the cocoa Ghana need this year, will never, they will never get it. They will never even get quota of it. Yeah. Because... Yes. Okay. But why are the farmers who know about the land, who live off of the land, giving their land away to miners? I would say that because of the economic hardship, a lot of people find it difficult to get farming inputs such as fertilizers to apply to their farms in order to get more produce. And ones that they are not able to get the fertilizers to be used on their farms, they are produced or they are produce, production that they are depending on reduces. Therefore, if someone comes and entices them that I want to give you this amount, they will be thinking that taking that amount of money will help them more than help uh, cultivating the crops. So that is the main reason why some people are selling their lands. All right, Kwaku, I want to come to you for a second because I read that there are also farmers who are facing intimidation, that if they don't sell their land to miners, then something bad or sinister unfolds, true? In fact, these miners are not negotiating. They are taking it by force. They just come, first off, to try and give you an option. We've covered the story of a farmer in the Ashanti region where illegal miners came and said, this your land is adjoining a mine that we think we have a lot of gold under. And so we are making you this offer. And in fact, usually the offer they make Far outstrip what you can get when you when you, you cultivate cocoa, for instance. But this farmer stuck to his guns and said he was not going to do that. This gentleman went back. The next day, they brought the equipment onto the farm and started mining actively, literally threatening him that if he took any other steps, they were going to they were going to take his life or something of that sort. There's also another community where illegal miners, some of them just invaded the community. The farmer, uh, the, the chief of that community and his elders, as well as some community members, went in there to try and force them away. They had guns and they, 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 they chased them away. Our own colleague, Erasmus Sarodonko Awula, has mentioned, mentioned him. And they were filming in the forest in the Ashanti region. They were seized by an armed group who were protecting an illegal mining concern.
session. They beat him up. They seize his equipment. Some of them are, undergo, are, are, are on trial at the moment. Others are on the run. And so these illegal miners, some of them are very powerful. The pests that back them are influential. They are rich. And these persons themselves have a lot of guns. They have ammunitions. And so when they go there, these farmers are left to battle out against these persons. Most of the time, the, the result is clear from the start. They are yeah. bound to lose. Okay, let me ask uh, Dr. Obin here. Because we had the gentleman there say that the government is very busy arresting activists. Are they also busy arresting the people who are harassing farmers? Are they also busy looking for the illegal miners? Well, I don't think uh, the government is busy trying to arrest the wrongdoers. Um, I believe that in 2017, for example, government made a very real attempt to address the issue of Galamse. And, and they, they adopted a very wrong approach. They militarized the approach and they did that in a very few a few weeks or so. Can you can you explain that please? The fact that the soldiers were deployed to go randomly to any small scale mining site and Galamse site and then uh, either seize their equipment, whether or not they were producing in a in a in a legitimate place. They burned some of the equipment, some equipment were seized and distributed from the stories that we got, distributed to uh, some people, allegedly pa uh, party officials, some of, we say in Ghana, that some of the equipment flew, they, they grew wings and flew away from this country. So, so government was not very committed to resolving the issue. And up until now, we are about eight years or seven years into that. You cannot see any foot, uh, you know, like blueprint to addressing the issue of illegal mining. I know that you know, uh, unemployment is there. We have gold. We have always mined gold. And, and so it's a bit of a challenge. But the nature of our mining, the approach to our mining now, the methodology of our mining now has changed. Yeah. In the early days, we were using simple implement when the laws were made. But when the laws were made, they anticipated the use of very simple, very artisanal implement. And so nobody complained about mining, whether legal or illegal. Anytime government went to chase the illegal ones, they were only enforcing the law and not complaining that uh, the, the, the water bodies were being polluted. When mining became, small scale mining now became a wealth issue, no longer an, a, 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 a an, you know, process of eking out a living, but rather creating wealth where the people involved are really big men, big people, including politicians by what has been published openly that everybody knows. Sometimes very active party, uh, current government party uh, uh, operatives, they are involved. So it makes the fight difficult for government itself because if you have your own people being alleged to have been involved in that and no action has been taken, you know, you need to, sh to, to, to demonstrate commitment by taking action. Okay, let me ask you, because you are seated in one of those big chairs that you're talking about. You are, in fact, one of those, one of those big men. You are, you are. So is there corruption in the commission? Why isn't anything happening? Um, I mean, uh, it, I, I can't say yes or no, but I wouldn't be surprised that there will be corruption. I mean, surely, you, because, you, you are leading the commission. Yes, I think you would know. Because I wasn't corrupt, and I can tell you on authority, and I look at my God all the time, I served as a Minerals Commission CEO. I also was a CEO of the Chamber of Mines. I don't have a centella of concession. I don't have a small piece of concession because I thought it was unconscionable for me superintending or supervising the, 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 the management of these resources and then also cutting part for myself. I mean, I can take every portion of it for myself or for my family, but I can say on authority, anybody can see that, I have never had a small bit of concession to myself. So I wasn't corrupt. And you know, people who are corrupt. But is the system corrupt? Yes, yes, the system is corrupt. All right, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but we do need to go on a short commercial break. Do not go anywhere, please. We will be right back.
Chartered Institute of Marketing Ghana's 33rd President's Ball comes on live on Saturday, the 30th of November. Come, let's connect and have fun. It is time to network with the business and marketing community. This year, our theme is harnessing the power of AI as a transformative tool for marketers. Come, let's welcome our new members and celebrate Chartered Marketers, the pinnacle of our marketing profession. Where? Lancaster Hotel, Accra. When? Saturday, November 30th, 2024. The time, 7 p.m. Be there. Dress code, CIMG cloth or any formal attire. And the year in grand style and come dance with the president and to good music. Book your seat now. Call 055-274-6592. The CIMG 33rd President's Ball, Lancaster Hotel, Accra is the destination. Saturday, 30th November, 7 p.m. sharp. CIMG, marketing means business. CIMG, working for Ghana. I'm a Ghanaian, and I love luxury accredited faith, and I love democracy. December 7th, Ghana is voting. Only peace, peace, I give it to you all. I love Ghana. Peaceful election, before, during, and after. One Ghana. Peace, peace to everybody. Yeah, well, well, Ghana. 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 This message brought to you from the luxury accredited faith. I have a little bit of a Oh, we are ready to go. I have a little bit of 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 a little Coming this December 7th. How? By voting for LPG, Kofi Apalu. He has promised every Ghanaian child a monthly benefit of 500 cities. Wow. wow. He has also promised every Ghanaian who is not working a monthly benefit of 700 to support you and your family. That's not all of my sister. He's also bringing the free university policy so your brother can go to the university for free. LPG, Abba, Amadana, Abba, Yekrabe. this 7th December. Ghana stands at a crossroads. Air pollution, a silent crisis, claims thousands of lives each year and incurs billions in economic losses. Yet despite its devastating impact, clean air remains largely absent from political conversations. As we approach the 2024 elections, this national dialogue will scrutinize the manifestos of political parties to see where they stand on the urgent need for clean air. Join experts, policymakers, activists, and citizens as we delve into the health and economic toll of air pollution, its link to climate change, and the social injustices it amplifies. This dialogue will also uncover the resources at Ghana's disposal and highlight how decisive action can safeguard the health of citizens, spur economic growth, and position Ghana as a leader in environmental stewardship. Make your voice count. Choose a future where clean air is a priority. It's live on Joy News, Joy 99.7 FM, and at myjoyonline.com on the 26th of November, 2024, at the Ghana Institution of Engineering, Roman Ridge, at 10 a.m. This broadcast is brought to you with funding from the Clean Air Fund Ghana. Clean air, clear choice. Your vote for a healthy Ghana. Mahama once said, I've seen more demonstrations and strikes <laughs> in my first two years. I don't think it can get worse in the second two years. I have the dead goat syndrome. <laughs> Dadanoa, on December 7th, vote for integrity, competency, and development. Eshuro. This festive season, it's time to go big and go loud. Because with Go TV, Bronya City. From match days and movie days to local stories, big little adventures. Really? It's unmatched entertainment for the whole family. Yes. Go TV brings the joy anytime, anywhere. Get your festive season sorted. Get Go TV. 
They came, they cooked, judges scored, you voted, and now, who wins the ultimate prize? Will it be Kofoidia Technical University, Takwadi Technical University, Kumasa Technical University, or will Ho Technical University retain the title? Be at the Great Hall of Kumasi Technical University on the 1st of December 2024 to witness culinary skills, mouth-watering dishes, and drama. Performances by Strongman, Copy Tuesday, Sandy Global, and Bad Boy Thai. Audience must be seated by 3 p.m. sharp. Vote for your favorite by dialing star 711, star 60 hash and follow the prompt. Big Chef Teshari Season 2 is proudly brought to you by Frito Cooking Oil. You deserve a life of goodness. Fortune Spread. Delicious all-purpose margarine. Hallmark Cafe. Visit us today and taste the future of fine dining. Hallmark Cafe. A delight in every sip and bite. Chef Wear. Confidence in action. Indomie. You like no other. Deadal Spices. Taste day inside. Enterprise Life. Earn points and get rewarded. Kivo Hot Pepper. Meku Show Bigo Drinks, Verna Purified Water, McBerry Breakfast Cereal, Echo Bank Ghana, The Pan African Bank, Chanel Rice, Rice Premium Quality, Dettol Soup, Intigas Kitchen, Your Premium Kitchen Solution, K Net, Salty Water, Levon 2, and City Blood Tonic, and supported by Adasa Travels, Western Serene Atlantic Hotel, Volta Serene Hotel, Micklin Hotel, Grand Casamora Hotel, and Gariba Lodge. Big Chef Teshari, the kitchen has no boundaries. And welcome back to this special production between DW News at 77% and Joy News and Joy Premium. Now, before we went on the break, we did hear uh, the former CEO of the Mining Commission say to us that while you might not be corrupt, you do believe that the system has been corrupted. And I just want to come back to you, James. When you hear that, how does it feel? And the miners, who owns them? <laughs> the miners are for the people. Yeah. Yeah. We <laughs> the mines are for the people, but the concessions are given to someone, right? That license is issued to someone. Are they politicians usually? Of course. Uh, they are everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you see, it's like, they are like pesticides. You can't take them out of this. <laughs> Most of them are holding large, large concessions and you can attest to that. Yeah. Rastus can attest to that. And everyone is aware of this. If even, even if I say they are not part of it, everybody will laugh at me. They, they, they would definitely know I'm lying, so I wouldn't lie here. So let me ask uh, the group then, raise your hand if you believe that politicians are involved in Gallup. Oh, wow. I didn't even need to, I, did, I didn't need to finish asking the question. Uh, so you've raised both hands and yet you are in a political party at the moment which seeks to address this issue. But how can the people who are causing the problem come up with a cure? Yeah, that's quite unfortunate. And I wish the issue of uh, f uh, addressing the Galamse or illegal mining challenge should be seen as a national issue more than a political issue because it's a common, it's our common good. You know, unfortunately, it has become politicized. The current, I mean, the, the NDC party, uh, they are praying to come to power uh, come December this year. Um, and, and they're looking at finding a way of addressing this challenge. They think it is addressable. First of all, in the issue of uh, mining on water bodies. The former president, who is the flag bearer and is likely to become the next president, has been saying that it's, it's, it's an issue of law enforcement. The law does not allow 
any mining to take place on water bodies. So yes, yes, indeed. However, you see, it still doesn't answer my question. If the people breaking the law are the ones meant to implement it, how do we move forward? Because you have politicized it now, I'm saying what they intend to do. They will remove everybody on water bodies using whatever means possible to remove them permanently. In fact, there has been some attempt recently to do that. But you see, you must be committed to an effort that you are uh, making. Uh, the, 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 the military will go there today, well, sometimes in the morning, and in the evening, the guys are there. They tell you we are running shift. The military comes in the morning or in the afternoon, and we go in the morning. So if, if, if government were committed, they will find a way of taking them off permanently. And the president, uh, the former president says, when he comes to power, he's going to insist. And even if it means flying uh, helicopter on the water bodies, because 16 of our water bodies are completely gone. Okay. So, so that's one. And then secondly, um, you know, our forest, which is a very important resource to us, there has been a law by this government that says, oh, you can go and do mining in the forest without forest entry permit. This, this is unconscionable in my view. And the president says when he comes to power, the first thing he will do is to uh, uh, abrogate that, that law. All right. Okay, because I do not want to give you an opportunity to campaign on behalf of your candidate. <laughs> Allow me to speak to, to the economist here because while uh, Dr. Obin is saying that it's not a political issue, it absolutely is an economic one. And the price of gold, as we mentioned earlier, has gone up. Has that influenced the number of people who are trading? Yeah, I mean, gold is a precious mineral, and everybody knows the price of gold. In fact, when the whole world crashed, gold prices were going up. And if you have it today, you have, in fact, even the central bank has now realized that, I mean, one of the means of, I mean, controlling the city depreciation is to invest more in gold. And so gold has become a very, I mean, expensive, I mean, uh, uh, currency that, I mean, that everybody wants to. But the issue is that, should we look, look, looking at that from the perspective of the destruction is bringing to the economy now and in the future, which one should we go for? And actually, I'm curious, how much of the money that is, so, that is gotten from the sale of this gold comes back into the economy? Is it worth it, is what I'm asking? It is not. It is not because we all knew that there were so many reports that talks about, I mean, a lot of good going out of the country and less money coming in. Now, the, the, the reason is because... Those who are in illegal mining, they cannot export the gold legally. And so if it is formalized, that rather brings a lot of it into the, to the table, whereby government will get enough and then will be able to get exchange, enough, a lot of exchange, foreign exchange from it. So the issue will help economically in terms of building our fiscal space. Unfortunately, because it's linked to individuals who are in power, who are into politics, all they are interested in is what comes to themselves. Mm. And so instead of going to the economy and helping the country, individuals want to enrich themselves and their families. But what they forget is that you enrich yourself, you have your children who are still living in the country, you will grow, a lot of them are old. Very soon they'll be old, they'll be out of the system. They don't know where their children will go and buy food, where their children will go and buy water and drink, and they will contract these sicknesses. And then at the end of the day, they, all the money that they have gotten will not be able to save them. And so. Economically, it is a national issue that everybody needs to come on board for us to address, especially the politicians. Because, you know, if you really look at manpower, and that is something that others are also not looking at, the impact on the economy, that you have a working force, the youth, who are coming up. And then people are working, and then they start contracting strange sicknesses. And then they have to spend a lot of man hours outside in the hospitals or taking care of themselves, which will have been productive and so we, are, we have a lot of money being lost as a result of that as well. That is what is going to impact that. Because if you have a working population that at a certain point contrasts strange sicknesses and then they don't have the strength to be able to work, of course then you are, looking, you are losing productivity. And when productivity is lost, your GDP will be impacted. And when GDP is impacted, revenue definitely will impact the economy. Yeah, so let me hear from Kwaku because we've heard about you know, the impact on the economy. But based on your coverage, what are some of the medium-term effects that you're seeing coming from not just the illegal mining but the 
the poisoning of your waterways? Well, we just saw that documentary that Erastus did. People are giving birth to children that are completely deformed. We have absolutely no idea why that, that is happening. And that is why people like Awula and activists are asking the government to revoke LI 2462 that allows mining in forests. I'm sorry, LI 24 what? LI 2462. That is a, 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 an instrument that government has passed through parliament, which is currently a law in force that allows the president to give permit for mining to be done in forest reserves, in protected reserves, and these forests are completely being obliterated, they are being destroyed. Organized Labour this year, at the start of, uh, at, the, uh, at the middle of this year, decided to shut down government and go on a strike. The government promised that they were going to revoke that ally. Parliament went to sit for several days, they did not bring that ally, and then there was a political stalemate in Parliament, and they had to go away. And so the effect is in such a way that it is, it is multifaceted. Every person, one way or the other, is affected by this illegal mining menace even in ways you do not feel it. And in cocoa, look at cocoa, for instance. Ghana used to be the top producer of cocoa in the world. We've lost that to Ivory Coast. And in fact, at some point, we wanted to do 80,000 metric tons. We're struggling to do 500,000 because cocoa farmers are looking at the cocoa farming they are doing and illegal miners coming in with a gun and saying that, listen, we're either giving you the money or we're showing you a gun. You're going to go anyway. And so government needs to know that, listen, this is an existential threat. This is an existential crisis. It goes beyond all the petty issues that they want to do. But ultimately, because as we've heard around the table, politicians themselves are the kingpins. They are the ones driving this business. The political will is not there. And that is why the effect is so huge. Everyone is struggling. Uh, you spoke about Coco and here we have Isifu. Thank you for joining us. He was busy because he's a busy man on another radio station. Uh, but we were just talking about the short-term effects of illegal mining. And when we spoke earlier, you said something dramatic to me, that you have a river on your farm, but you're not able to use it. Yes, some years back, cocoa farmers used to get rivers around their cocoa farms. They just type on these rivers. They, they use them for their farming activity. Today, all these rivers are gone. You can't access them anymore because they are fully polluted with full mercury and contaminated metals. Mm -hmm. And this has caused a lot to we the farmers. As I speak, I have cocoa in Akontomra, I have cocoa in Sefibakwai. And you could see that today, if you want to access water, you have to buy water from the city, transport it with tricycle, and even the cost and the poor road network to connect this tricycle for you to get water in your farm is very difficult. That's why we are now producing less. Last year, Ghana was not able to produce 550,000 metric tons. And this year will be dangerous because if you look at the output level as we speak now, we should have been in our peak level. But the cocoa is already gone. We don't have cocoa beans uh, uh, in the farm. And it is unfortunate. Okay, so what happens to the existing cocoa market if it is threatened by infiltration of mercury into your plants? Yes, so today as we speak uh, at the you know, in New York market, cocoa is trading around $8,200 because of the decline in cocoa production. And it tells you that farmers are not benefiting uh, from this because the cocoa beans are not there to sell. And it is unfortunate that if this uh, harmful substance are detected in our cocoa beans, then we are doomed forever because these cocoa beans are going to be rejected in the international market and people will not like to use these beans for chocolate. So it, 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 it is my prayer that all efforts should be made. We need a nationalistic uh, approach to fight this menace. Within than that, in the next five, ten years, cocoa farmers are going to be in danger. Yeah. Are you afraid for your livelihood? Yes. Yeah. Very, very afraid, of course. Okay. I want to hear from Lois. Uh, what are people thinking about some of the things that we've heard from our panelists here? Yes, let me find out from this gentleman now. You've heard, you've seen, we've spoken at, at length. Uh, what have you taken out so far and what do you think youth can do to solve all of these? Okay, what I've taken so far is that um, Galaxy is becoming a menace and we need to take an action yesterday, very yesterday. So um, I think there's more to do than just protesting and all those stuff, those kind of stuff. And what's that? Yeah, what do you think youth can do to solve all of these? I think you can do a whole lot more. I think you can protest online and all that stuff to help the cause. Now, let me see by hands, first-time voters here. First-time voters. Okay, uh, let me come to you. Now, we've heard Galamsey is still going on here. If there's anything, some people have voted. Uh, you are going to be voting for the first time. What are you looking at? What is that one thing that the political parties will say that would make you say, okay, I want to vote for party A or party B? Honestly speaking, I am in a dilemma as to which party to vote for because... What I have observed is that when MPP is in power, it's only NDC that finds Galamse bad. 
when NDC is in power, it's only MPP that finds calamity. In fact, some years ago, um, Professor Frempon Boateng published a documentary to the effect of how Galamse had become very devastating. But MPP and MPP members, NDC did say. And so I think it's a shared responsibility, and we as citizens have a lot to do. Because a few years ago, Shitin Wan, China's ambassador to Ghana, made an assertion to the effect that um, it isn't the Chinese people who know where our good concessions are. It is we Ghanaians who direct them to where they are. And so it's a shared responsibility. We keep on mentioning government, 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 but it isn't, it isn't government responsibility alone. I think we can do this together, and together we can do something better about it. All right now, let me come to you. What is that one policy that you would hear that will make you say, I want votes? Because you know, we are heading to the polls a few weeks away. What are you looking at? Because with unemployment, you heard me say that uh, Joy News Research Desk has proven that or has brought facts that show that 2 million youth in Ghana are not working. What are you looking for in the manifestos that the political parties, even let's look at our two major political parties, NPP and NDC, they've already brought their manifestos out. What do you want to hear that would make you say, okay, I will vote for this party? Okay, okay to stop Galam's It would also help us to know better about or about Galamse and also help us to um, talk Galamse because I believe that people in the rural areas who don't have education, they don't have any access to education. Therefore, they feel that. They don't have the knowledge about their. A, ma a magnitude of Galamse. So I think also advocates about um, Galamse and to also know more about Galamse and then to help keep Galamse in Ghana. Right. Let me come to you finally. What can we do as youth? Okay, to stop all of this, what can we do? Because if the government is not doing anything, as I said earlier, and you are a youth, you're still here, you're still in Ghana, you're enjoying everything, you're seeing what's happening. What do you think we as youth can do to keep all of this for ourselves? Okay, so it boils down to understanding. It, it has to do with the mindset. So you should understand the disadvantages and the negative effects Galamse is bringing to us, a long-term negative effect, so that we, we can be like motivated to help fight Galamse. Now, there are mediums that we have as youth. Okay, right. Someone is calling me, beckoning me at the back there. All right, so, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we are all looking at the dangers of the Galamse and stopping, stopping, stopping. But let's look at something here. Farmers are also, previously farmers were working. And then you will not hear too much bad news about Galamse. But here lies the case that a market woman will buy something from the farm. Some, some like maybe let's say a bag of tomato or box of tomato for 50 cities and it will come to the market and be selling about 300 cities it will cost that so me the farmer looking at the the toy that i'll do on the land for you to transport it to wherever you are going to sell and put that amount of price on it if i have two sons who also have a friend that their dad uh, a friend of their dad is uh, engaging in galamsey they would rather move to that man rather than help him in the farm so i think it's high time for us to also look at the, uh, the farmers from the field the primary produce we should also contribute to them help them well i think when we are supporting them and their work is going on the children will not run into the field of galamsey we the youth also we are now everyone wants to work in the office we come to school we want to graduate get into the office and sit in the air condition and get a better work to do. But when our parents were struggling, selling their clothes to bring us to school, they were expecting that we would come to school, gain knowledge and add it to what they are doing on the field so that they can excel. So I think it is high time you also consider ourselves as what contributors to what our parents are, contributors to what excelling of our parents. It is not about the Galamse alone because if we are to be truth and realistic, Galamse is not going to be stopped now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in for the Galamse work, but it's not going to end now. But what this basic solution can bring it down. And as time goes on, we can, I think, equally or at a point in time, it will be over. That is my, 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 my side. So you heard from him. 
the change starts with us. We, the youth, are the change. If anything, we have to start ourselves. We will eventually turn Ghana into the Ghana we want to see. Edith, over to you. Right. Uh, it seems like we have magically switched microphones <laughs> uh, mid-production. I'll just have that one because it's more stable. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Uh, now, it's interesting that you were talking about the effects that people are already feeling, yes. talking about food in the market. Mm -hmm. And I just want to come back to you, Ms. Awula, because when you look at the future, it doesn't look very secure right now for Ghanaians in terms of food security. We're hearing that production of cocoa has already gone down. How long will it take? reverse the effects of what we are seeing already? Well, I'll say the thousand mile journey begins with one step. And as has already been said by a young person, we can start yesterday. The next best time is today. The problem we have right now is that the firefighters are the arsonists. Mm. Those who are supposed to be stopping Galamse are those who are actually supporting it. Because as one person said, you cannot have Galamse if either the chief the political authority or the police are not involved. If all three say no illegal mining, trust me, there'll be no illegal mining. And I'd like to give the case of Atronsu, because as some of the farmer was talking about their produce. Atronsu, they are cocoa farmers. The government wanted to bring community mining. They said, we do not want community mining. But be that as it may, illegal miners have gone there. And as we speak, they have polluted the Atronsu stream, the only source of drinking water. And believe it or not, those who were actually um, put in custody were the activists who tried to stop it. Yeah. But the illegal miners, we reported it to the regional minister, we reported it to a police commander. They were arrested for a very short time, given police bail. They went right back to the illegal mine. The activists who were trying to stop it were actually arrested, refused police bail, refused court bail. And they were arrested on Farmer's Day. The irony of it, cocoa farmers arrested on Farmer's Day. One person who went to take them food was also arrested. And the five of them were released on the Wednesday. So they spent Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday night in custody for trying to protect the Atronsa stream. Now, when we're talking about the economy of it all, I would say without any hint of contradiction that illegal mining is about greed. Mm. When you have organizations like Akonta Mining who are accused of being involved in, the, in illegal mining, they're not poor people. So we are saying that Professor Frimpong Boateng had a report, investigate his report. All those who he mentioned, investigate them. If they are found guilty, use the polluter pays principle. All the ill-gotten wealth should be used towards, towards the um, restoration of the, the landscape. And we should all remember that our party is Ghana. It is a national issue. And this whole idea that mining alone is bringing us wealth, we're talking about over 2 million peasant farmers who may lose their livelihood because of illegal mining. They are fishermen. They are farmers, as has been said. So mining is not the only means of um, receiving an income. And as was said, this LI2462, this perverse piece of legislation that was passed in Parliament, so both parties were involved, which allows mining not just in forest reserves, but in globally significant biodiversity areas, which shows us that we've lost the plot. We've lost the plot. And let me make it clear that when you talk about mining, when we get, let's say, about 5 billion, only about 1.5 billion is used in the country. Yeah. We get far, far more from remittances. We get far more from um, non-traditional export. And of course, from cocoa. But we're at risk of losing what we get from cocoa because the poison has entered the food chain. We know that some of our exports contain mercury and we don't know what will happen with cocoa if we don't stop this canker today. We can stop it. All right. So first things first, let me dress the microphone <laughs> before we continue. Uh, and as I'm doing that, I'm just curious Dr. Obi, because we're talking about heavy metals like mercury, which are being used in the, in the mining of gold. But these are not things that you just go to a pharmacy or a hardware store and you get access to. Where are people getting their hands on these things from? You know, as part of regularizing small-scale mining, the mercury law was passed. And this law allowed for mercury to be legitimately imported into the country. So it's an internal, it's a self-destruct type of thing. But uh, just to, to their defense, I mean, the defense of those who made the law, uh, at that time, there wasn't any known proper method of amalgamating the gold. However, now, Ghana is a signatory to the Minamata Convention, which does not allow for mercury to be used. So I'm sure in the next few years, mercury will be completely outlawed. Uh, in any case, a lot of technology 
uh, have come up that make that, that that are superior to the use of mercury, and not only in terms of its uh, 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 negativity as a poison, but also in its efficiency. I mean, obviously, it has its applications, but you don't want it in your water. Absolutely. I mean, it's only, only mercury. You know, tests that have been conducted by various scientific communities indicate there's cadmium, which is heavy metal, there's lead, there's arsenic, there's uh, whatever. I mean, about six of the heavy metals can be found in, our, in a lot of our water bodies. So it's very dangerous, the, the, the state in which we find ourselves. Okay, in that case, let me ask Mercy here, because on top of being a triathlete, you're also an activist. And young people might be watching thinking, oh gosh, this is all sounding so overwhelming. What can I do as a young person to try and rectify this issue? You know how we have the plants Ghana Day? We have plants that take heavy metals from the soil and our water body. So maybe these young ones, when we have our plants gonna days or any day, maybe on your birthday, you decide, oh, I want to plant something. They can do sunflower, which is very good when it comes to extracting leads and heavy mercury in our land, which would eventually help take out these heavy metals out of the land. And it's, it wouldn't be just one day, but as time goes on, it's going to help. Okay. So, Dr. Peter, I want to come back to you because the economic implication of this, we're talking about degraded lands, possibly pits that might be open for decades. What would that mean for the Ghanaian economy? Hmm. Uh, it's like when you talk about Galamse, you talk about these things, the effect, you, 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 it seems like there is no hope. Mm. But um, I believe strongly that we need leaders who will understand that the future is more important because Ghana must remain Ghana. We cannot destroy Ghana today and then tomorrow we live as if there will be, there will, there will be no human beings that will live in Ghana. And so the effect is that see, we have the giant like the Anglo Gold, the New Month, who are doing mining activities that you don't even know of. Of course, they are doing land reclamation where they are helping to actually, I mean, reform the land again. But the issue is because we allow the surface mining to take place and because they don't have the equipment that will enable them to do the deep one. Okay. So, so again, what is surface mining? Well, I, 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 the, 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 I think the expert on that is we, we, we have the situation where those who, the giant who use the equipment to do the deep mining, the surface mining is where I think you don't go deeper mm -hmm. to the grounds, but uh, of course you go some level and then you get a go there then you wash it. Right. Okay. Yes. So, and because when they do that, they leave it open and it go. The residues is what others go to take and wash into the river bodies. And that's what is polluting the river bodies. And so when there's rest, we call it, they, they, they are calling it as responsible mining. But who are the ones involved in the responsible mining? Nobody can tell. You ask everybody and they tell you that, I mean, they are doing the right in the small scheme and they are doing the right. But it is the effect of their work. The end result of their work, that is resulting in the pollution of the water bodies. Okay. And so we have to look at it from the perspective of how even those who go to the mining come about. I think that allowing the president or the minister to issue licenses is wrong. Mm -hmm. For me, going forward, all licenses should be issued by parliament, where if, you want, if anybody wants to go into mining activities, the license must go to the floor of parliament and let it be approved, just like the way tax waivers are approved as well. Because when you leave it to an individual, in a day, several licenses can be issued in a day. It can be issued on a Sunday, it can be issued in the night, it can be issued at dawn. So you're saying there's no transparency? Of course, there is not. Yeah. So I believe that it has to be sent to parliament so that parliament will look at it. Then you can have an institution that you can be held, that can be held responsible for it. And I think that is one of the ways that it can. But unfortunately, the, if you leave it in the hands of the politicians, because when they come to power, they have short period, four-year lifespan. So he is looking at what he can do to recoup his expenses that he incurred during the campaign. Yeah. And so it's, it's very difficult for them to disallow those who are involved in it because they are the ones who give them the money to run a campaign. And that is what we are seeing. All right. So we've been talking a lot about the challenges around this. So many problems and it's a very multi-layered issue. And when we come back, we're going to be hearing the solutions, which means we're about to take another short break. Don't go too far.
Welcome back to this special live production between DW News and Joy TV News and Premium. Thank you so much for watching. If you've been following us, then you know we've been talking about a lot of problems related to Galamse, but we want to leave you with some solutions. And I want to come to you, James, because you've been implicated in the problem, but you also want a solution. So what do you think from the minor side needs to be done in order for this problem to be behind you? Um, uh, like they are saying, we are all affected by this situation. So we equally want solutions to this. But then I, all I could say is um, they should, the government or whoever is in authority should make us the gatekeepers. Okay, like you are working, let's say, Legon, around Legon. As the miners? Yes, around Legon. Isn't that difficult to regulate yourselves? No, not as in regulations. But I'm saying if you are mining around the pool and someone is doing it illegally, mm. uh -huh, you should be able to report the person and then authority will come in. Either than that, army will come in the morning, afternoon we will mine. Mm. I'm telling you. Yeah. On the river bodies, the armies that are coming, they can't swim. Me, myself, I can't swim. If, I mean, you come to my site and let's say I'm mining on the river bodies, you can't catch me. And I'm a swimmer. You can't catch me. You, uh, what you are doing is in vain. And mind you, they are making huge sums of money, especially the chamfine, the proper galamsey. We, we wash like eight hours. They, they can wash like 30 minutes. And what you wash like eight hours, they will do that without buying diesel. And they make more than you do. Yeah. So do you think it's easy to stop them? No. Always... Supervise. Okay. So you're saying get involved in the management of this process. I like that. Um, I'd like to speak to Isifu here. As a farmer, you're obviously affected. Your livelihood is on the line, as we've spoken about. What do you think needs to change? I know that in Ghana, the constitution has mandated the president. All lands are invested in the hand of the president. And we need authorities to speak. Though, holistically, we can all come together. But if the president, who has been given the mandate to ensure that our environment is protected, is not being seen in action, taking action, there is nothing we can do. We can talk, we can sing, we can fight, we can kill ourselves, we can so what we can say whatever we want to say in the world, but we need the president to act. So the president should speak, he should act, and he should work. Okay. Uh, because this is something that is cross-sectoral, there's the political sector, the economic sector, and the private class. Uh, the people who are watching, who are investors, who are interested in perhaps environmental management, what can they do? How can they tap into the solutions? Well, the Galamsey is as, I would say, is as old as Adam. Because, I mean, in the 18th century, these things have been done. I mean, there was a research by... I mean, one, I mean, David Amaldi, I think he's in the University of uh, Ghana uh, History Department. I mean, in 2015, where he published this research work in the International uh, Scholars Journal, where he was looking at mining in the pre-colonial era and then uh, mining in the current uh, uh, dispensation and talked about how mining started. So it's like people were born into it. And when you, are, you want to handle a, pro a, sol a problem, that people were born into it, you tackle it from the root cause. Mm -hmm. And other than that, you can't stop it. And so it, it requires a lot of engagement. You realize that they, they, one of the panelists was saying that they wanted, they, went, they, went, they, they wanted to engage a community whereby they will have to look at community mining. And they said no, because they think that when it happens like that, the, the, the real revenue that comes to them individually will not. Mm -hmm. And so it's about engaging them and then finding out alternative livelihood for them. Okay. Then that will reduce the number of people who go into it. And so if you are an investor and you want to come into it, um, in order not to get your investment going in the drain, you have to first of all go through the formal process and also ensure that you are going to do responsible mining whereby you don't pollute the environment. Unfortunately, you know, when people get here, the, 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 the community... I mean themselves, the talking about the indigenous are the ones who most of the time influence the I mean activities that pollute the environment. So I think that if you're an investor you want to come in, you want to secure your investment, then the right thing is to go to the right process so that your investment will be secure. So I like that you've also brought back community engagement, which uh, James already started with. Mr. Wola, we started this conversation with you. I would like to hear your final thoughts as well. How do we make sure that the generation who are having children right now, their children are not having a similar street debate 10, 20 years from now talking about Galamse? Well, I'll start by saying that if our forefathers had been wicked as we are, we don't have come to meet the forest reserves and the beautiful water bodies we have. It's pure wickedness and greed. And as I said, we can stop it today if the political will is there, because we can encourage the government to do the right thing, like we're going to go on a, on a general um, strike. 
if um, organized labor hadn't pulled out. But it is not too late. We need to reorganize and we need to ensure that the government does what it's mandated to do. But let's be very clear. The Constitution enjoins every single Ghanaian to work towards protecting the environment. But there are powers we don't have. We can't go to the forest reserves and drive out the illegal miners. We can't go to the river bodies and drive out the illegal miners. The president has the mandate. He has the the world with all to do it. And we are saying that if the political will is there, it will be done and we will stop it. It can be stopped. And let's all remember the mining is not the only means of um, getting an income. You know, we go on and on other things. And there's a green economy and the green economy is very wide. So it's not limited to mining. In some countries, they decided to leave the gold underground until they find better ways of exploiting it without destroying the environment. And the last thing I would say is that Professor Frimpon Boateng said it. When you destroy a forest, you have destroyed a pharmacy. When you look at the trees, look at the name tree, or even look at the moringa, it's not just the seeds, it's not that the bark, it's not just the leaves. There's so much for everybody. So what we are doing right now, apart from poisoning the environment, poisoning our water bodies, we are destroying our pharmacies. Yeah. Thank you so much for your thoughts and thank you to everyone. Um, I'd like to invite Joy here because she's my co-moderator here today, but you're also a Ghanaian. And as we wrap up, I just want to know from you, what are your thoughts and opinions about this issue being that you're living it? It's your reality. Exactly. So I like the fact that everyone here, especially the youth, you know, I'm very passionate about the youth and how they feel about this. I'm just happy that they have had, they're ready to fight. And I'm just asking every youth out there, do not give up on Ghana yet. Instead of moving outside Ghana to find greener pastures, let's save our own. You know, let's do what we can as hard and fast as we can to make sure that we, uh, you know, preserve our lands and we're taking very cautious efforts. We're making very cautious effort to preserve our lands. Also, we're heading to the polls. I'm asking that the first time voters out there will participate in the elections because she will have a voice and it will shock you that when you vote, you can effect change in the best way. So yes, it is. Yeah, uh, and so we started with a statistic. I'd like to leave you with one. that The analysts are saying that at the moment, the amount of land that's been degraded in this country is equal to the Vatican City. Uh, which were the other two? The Vatican City. Yeah, it was the <laughs> Vatican City, Gibraltar and mm. Monaco yeah. combined. Mm. That's how much land you've lost to environmental degradation. But as we've heard from everybody here today, it is possible to reverse that. So thank you all for watching. Yes. Thank you for being such a wonderful host to <laughs> us too. here. And we say to our people, bye-bye. <laughs>